welcome to our Bible study session this week, looking at Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 43. So we begin as we always do in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Saint Jerome, pray for us. Saint Matthew, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you always do, we listen back to that gospel just to refresh our memories of it. So we listen now to Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 43. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus put another parable before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. While everybody was asleep, his enemy came, sowed darnel among the wheat, and made off. When the new wheat sprouted and ripened, the darnel appeared as well. The owner's servants went to him and said, Sir, was it not good seed that you sowed in your field? If so, where does the darnel come from? Some enemy has done this, he answered. And the servant said, Do you want us to go and weed it out? But he said, No, because when you weed out the darnel, you might pull up the wheat with it. Let them both grow to the harvest. And at harvest time, I shall say to the reapers, First collect the darnel, and tie it in bundles to be burnt. Then gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable before them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the biggest shrub of all, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and shelter in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour, till it was leavened all through. In all this, Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he would never speak to them except in parables. This was to fulfil the prophecy. I will speak to you in parables and expound things hidden since the foundation of the world. Then leaving the crowds, he went to the house and his disciples came up to him and said, Explain the parable about the darnel in the fields to us. He, re he said in reply, The sower of the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed is the subject of the kingdom. The darnel, the subject of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them, the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. Well then, just as the darnel is gathered up and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of time. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of this kingdom, his kingdom all things that provoke offences and all who do evil and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Then the virtuous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Listen, anyone who has ears. In this long passage from St Matthew's Gospel, we hear three parables. We're hearing lots of parables at the minute. So last week, we didn't have Bible study, but last week we had the parable of the sower, the, the seed landing on the various different types of ground. This week, again, more parables to do with agriculture, but we're having more parables. And this section of Matthew's Gospel this discourse is often known as the discourse of the parables. So we have parables preceding this and we have parables following this. And all of this is coming kind of in the middle of Matthew's gospel. This is kind of the middle discourse. So in Matthew's gospel, there are five great discourses and this is the middle one. This is the third. Why five? Because Matthew is trying to show Jesus as the new Moses. So in the tradition, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. The Pentateuch, the, the Old Testament. And so what we're showing here by the five great discourses is Jesus writing the five new books. And so he's showing that link. So this is the middle discourse, the discourse of the parables. 
and it is full of symbolism toward the kingdom. The kingdom and the message. All of these play a central kind of running theme through each of the parables. And if you kind of put yourself in the shoes of someone who's listening to this, it feels really odd that he's using story after story after story after story after story, some long, some short. And as I kind of said in my, my homily this weekend, Jesus is trying to explain the ineffable, the indescribable in human language. He's trying to explain God, the kingdom, the message in a way that we can understand it. Because it is so amazingly transcendent, the divine will of God, trying to explain it in human terms is difficult. Made more difficult by the fact that he's trying to explain it to people who are not necessarily of the same level of education, not necessarily as well versed in the faith as each other, some more so, some less. Their, the comprehension level varies massively. As any teacher will tell you, this is exactly what it's like in any classroom. The comprehension level of what you're teaching among your pupils will vary massively. There will be those who are very bright, who get it very able, instantly. And you may only need one example to explain it. And yeah, I'm with you. There are some who you need to think of new examples and different examples and constantly thinking of a way to explain it. It's a classic teaching technique, a parable. We wouldn't necessarily use them as parables. We'd probably talk more about examples. But that's essentially what our Lord is doing. He's using parables, examples, to explain what he means. And so he's done things in this last section, in chapter 12. And now he's explaining why he has done the things that he's done. He's done them for the sake of the kingdom. He's done them for the sake of the message. He's done them for the proclamation of the gospel, which is the proclamation of salvation. And so he's showing now why it is that he's done what he's done. It's not easy. We remember parables quite a lot. Um, some parables we remember incredibly well. Some parables we don't. The parable of the sower is one which most of us will know very, very well. A lot of us will probably know the mustard seed, the, uh, the middle parable that we heard in that gospel. A lot of us will know the parable of the prodigal son. Few of us will know, will remember very well things like the parable of the darnel and the wheat, which we heard, and the leavened bread or the pearl, things of great value. There are lots of parables which are forgettable to us, but each one is explaining something ever so slightly different. They're looking at the same thing, but from a different perspective. And so our Lord is really trying to convey something important. And that's why it's parable, parable, parable in this gospel. He's really trying to explain something important. Take comfort in the fact that we even know the disciples don't get it. Okay, They don't get it. They ask him, can you explain that one to us? And that emphasises to us as well that with scripture, it's okay if you don't get it. It's okay if you don't get it. In the words of a priest friend of mine, if you look at scripture and you say, what are you on about Jesus? That's okay. We're not meant to fully understand it as soon as we read it. As soon as we read or hear scripture, we're not meant to understand it. Our brothers and sisters, Protestant brothers and sisters, talk about sola scriptura. Only the Bible is the only source of authority. But when you and I read the Bible, we'll read it completely differently to each other. You will read it one way, I will read it another. You will understand one thing, I may understand something completely different. So how do we come to understand actually what our Lord means? We need something to guide us. What's that thing that guides us? It's the church. And we go, oh well, the church is getting involved and sticking its oar in. The church is 2,000 years of great theologians, beautiful traditions, been handed on to us. It's a certain sense of arrogance to say that I know better because some of the greatest minds that have ever lived have contemplated and spent their entire lives meditating and praying and reflecting on these words of scripture. 
It helps to guide us. That's why good commentaries are really useful when reading the Bible, listening to the Bible, um, listening to scripture. Good commentary is always worth having to help understand because it's not always immediately obvious what it is that we're talking about. So we have these three parables. So let's kind of take them and address them in turn. So the very first parable is the wheat and the darnel. Now, what St. Matthew is laying out through what our Lord is saying is he's laying out how easily Jesus is immediately relating to the time. He knows the time period so well. Sowing darnel into your fields is a real first century agricultural problem. Okay, so much so that there was a law specifically against this. Why? Darnel, when you sow it into the fields of wheat, when it initially begins to grow, looks a lot like wheat. You can't tell the difference. But what it does is it wraps itself around the roots of the wheat and it can wither it. Reduces the harvest reduces the quality of the wheat. It could make someone bankrupt. It's really serious. But it does have a purpose. Darnell does have a purpose, and it's alluded to in the parable. Darnell was used for fuel. It's used for fires. And so it does have a purpose. But to sow it in someone's field is to sabotage their field. And so it's against the law. And it's incredibly difficult to remove. You can't just pick it out because if you pick it out, you're gonna take huge clumps of wheat. No farmer wants to do that. So they would let it grow and then reap it later on. So it's a real situation our Lord is referring to. And you can almost hear people's ears pick, prick up at this mention, like, oh, Oh, I know about that. Our Lord's using real world examples to explain something. Now, notice as well. The two reactions. The servants and the master. The servant's reaction is instantaneous. Put it out. The master's reaction is to wait. Let them both grow. And then at the time of reaping, we'll sort them. Why are these two kind of contrasting reactions? They convey a theological point. The servants and the master, they convey the point of the need for patience. Throughout these three parables, the obvious interpretation that we, we we immediately want to leap to is to talk about growth and yes they do talk about growth how faith can grow from the smallest thing to the greatest thing that it grows and flourishes that is a common thread throughout these parables it's an important theme don't get me wrong but it's not the only theme there's something that underlies the growth that runs through all three patience Patience is fundamental to the kingdom. That's what our Lord is saying. It's fundamental to what it is that our Lord is doing. No patience and it is ruined. This is why this applies particularly to the first parable. The servants are our gut reaction. The master is the Lord. If you consider when we see something that is wrong, our gut reaction is immediately to get rid of it, to rip it out. So too with sin in our lives. Our reaction surely should be to get rid of it, to go to confession, to get it absolved. That should be our instinct. That is a good instinct, that is a right instinct. And that works in our spiritual lives to a degree. Doesn't work in our community though. 
does it work as a Christian community? Because if we did that, there'd be no one in our church. When our Lord saw Peter deny him, Peter wasn't ripped out of the community permanently and thrown into the fire. There wasn't instant judgment. He let him return. And that's actually what's underlying the patience here. Is our Lord lets people sin. Stop and think that, about that for a second. He lets you sin. What do I mean? Our Lord doesn't stop you from sinning. We all know this. It sounds shocking, but we all know it. We all sin at one time or another. That's the wonder, the joy of the sacrament of reconciliation, that we can come back and turn back from that sin, but we all sin. When you sin, are you immediately thrown into hell? Well, unless you die in a state of mortal sin, no. you not immediately, the, get, the gates of hell don't immediately subsume you. And that's it. You have that possibility to return. You have that possibility for repentance. To come back to the Lord. You can be the most outrageous sinner your entire life. But the door to repentance and turning back to God is always open until the moment of your death. It is always open. You can always turn back to God. And that's what's really kind of underlying this. Is we always have that possibility to turn back to God. What it requires, though, is great patience. And it shows God's infinite patience for us. That he wants us to return back to him and that he will wait and wait and wait in this life for us to turn back to him. He's patient. And so he doesn't tear you out and immediately cast you into hell. There's not instant judgment in this life when we commit sin. Judgment only comes at the end of our life. Firstly, the particular and the universal. It only comes at the end. When our decision is kind of set in stone. Until that point, there's always the way back. Our Lord is patient with us. So where does that leave us with the next parable? The mustard seed. Yes. Instantly, we think growth. Tiny to huge. Wonderful. Yeah. But that requires patience too. The mustard seed is objectively tiny. And it grows exponentially. And this symbolism is echoing something from the Old Testament. So in Ezekiel, it talks about, the prophet Ezekiel talks about how... The kingdom of Israel will grow like a tree and that all will shelter, the birds of the air will shelter in this tree. It'll be a mighty cedar. Cedar is the great tree of the Middle East. Um, it even appears on the um, flag of Lebanon. It'll be a mighty cedar and the birds of the air will rest on it. Ezekiel chapter 17 verses 22 to 24. He's echoing what Ezekiel is saying, but it requires patience. It's not instant. A tree doesn't grow instantly. It takes time. The faith doesn't grow instantly within us. Rarely do we have a road to Damascus moment, but even in the case of St. Paul, his faith grew. But it requires patience. Patience with the Lord. Patience with discerning what it is that he's calling us to do. Then the third par parable then. This, again, growth, but it's actually hinting us toward, it's actually hinting us toward impressive yields. Impressive yields. 
we have this example now with a woman. The woman kneeling. The equality there between men and women. It's not that the, the kingdom of God is not limited to men only. It is for full equality among all humans, men and women, side by side. But what it's saying is how much something small, the impact that something small can have. So we talk, we talk about three measures. So it talks about three measures of wheat flour. Three measures, what's that? It's about 60 pounds in old money of flour. That woman is baking bread for about 100 people. It's bounty. And what he's saying is how much a little bit of yeast can create something so plentiful. Therefore, how much a little bit of faith, both in us and in the world, can produce such great fruits. And we see this in the examples of some of the great saints of the church. Saint Francis of Assisi. How a little bit of effort flourished into the Franciscan order. And the amazing work that they do. Saint Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa. One woman, fiery, but one woman changed and transformed mission in India to care for the poor and the outcasts and the immense and amazing work that they do. St John Paul II, one man with faith, helped bring down the communist regime. How much a little faith how can produce great bounties. But it requires patience. Bread doesn't leaven instantly. It requires patience, it requires time. And so it's also showing as well, we're talking about bread, and so we should obviously see the instant linking between that and the Last Supper, the Passover meal, which becomes the first Mass, the Eucharist. We should also see the link between that and the Bread of Life discourse in John's Gospel, I am the Bread of Life. We should also see in the same symbolism that our Lord constantly brings us back to, symbolism of the banquet, the banquet with the Lord. It's a common symbol throughout the Old Testament that when the covenant was established, the elders, and the priests ate a banquet with the Lord on the mountain. The banquet is the mass. The banquet is the wedding feast of the Lamb. The banquet is the universal banquet in heaven. Symbolism that our Lord keeps coming back to. And he'll use it again and again and again. Matthew 22, 1 to 14. 25, 1 to 13. It's a symbol that he comes, comes back to again and again and again. And so then at the end of these parables, Matthew tells us, Jesus teaches in parables. Which by this point is a little bit moot. Well, I hope. Yeah, we've just seen that. But it explains why. He says, this is to fulfil prophecy. And we then get this quote. Where does this quote come from? This quote comes from Psalm 78. This was a psalm, according to the tradition, written by David. I will open my mouth in parables. I will announce what is, um, what has lain hidden from the foundation of the world. What he's showing is... Matthew is showing the instant link there. The son of David, Jesus, is conveying the divine will. He's conveying the divine mind. He's showing the message of God. It is God revealing himself. And so we can say, in a sense, it's summing up the Old Testament history of salvation. That Jesus is the one bringing to fulfilment God's plan. He's showing what was hidden in the Old Testament is now revealed in the new, is revealed in the person of Christ, God's self-revelation of himself. 
And then we, we end up in this situation. Jesus moves away from the crowds, so he's taught them, he's moved away. And the disciples come to him and want that explanation. They don't ask when everyone's around. They're a little bit embarrassed because they're showing their ignorance. So they wait till they're alone with Jesus and then they ask. And our Lord gives that explanation, telling us about the evil one, the fire, the reapers, the wheat, the darnel. We can often sanitise Christianity to the point that we no longer talk about the devil and hell and judgment. We talk about I'm okay, you're okay. We talk about everyone goes to heaven. When someone dies, heaven's gained a new angel, which in itself is riddled with theological problems. But we talk about everything always in the positive sense. We're all going to go to heaven, aren't we? Well, no. We can only go to heaven, as I, as I keep saying, if we conform ourselves to Christ, we remain true to the church and we receive him in the sacraments. We receive his grace. We can only do those things. Those are the only guaranteed way to heaven. The only guaranteed way. We need to be united to the suffering of Christ on the cross. It is essential. But not everyone's going to die in that way. The brutal reality, I know, but it's true. Now, we don't know who they are, because we don't know what people's disposition is to the Lord at the moment of their death. We don't know. That is known only to God himself. But our Lord tells us the devil is real. He is real. Jesus says so. Truth himself speaks truly, all is not in truth. Hell is real. And hell is a possibility. And that there will be judgment at the end of time. Our Lord is pretty firm on that. There will be judgment at the end of time. And we will be judged according to how we have lived. We will be judged. So what we need to do is to conform ourselves to Christ, receive him in the sacraments, stay true to his body, the church. But God has patience with us. He allows us that possibility to turn back to him in this life. In this life, we will always have that possibility. We should never take that for granted. We should always seek him out. Never take it for granted. But that we will be given that possibility. So Saint Isidore of Pelusium um, offers a kind of really interesting explanation of the weeds and the wheat. So this is the, the parable that Jesus then goes on to explain because the disciples don't quite understand it. It's the very first one. And he says, God forbids the angels to gather up the evildoers, lest they uproot the good wheat together with the tares. That is so that the sinner may not be cut off while in his mind there is yet a possibility of repentance. And he goes on to say, God did not slay Matthew, who had given himself to exacting of the tribute. Didn't kill Matthew as he was a tax collector. So that he might not thus impede the preaching of the gospel. But Matthew turned to Christ after his call. He wrote the gospel, that great proclamation. But he turned to Christ and was through him we were able to understand and encounter the Lord through sacred scripture. Neither did he destroy the harlots who served lust and immodesty, lest models of repentance might be wanting. Even those of sexual sins, he didn't slay them, destroy them, throw them into hellfire. He gave them that possibility. He avenged not Peter's denial, because already he had beheld his burning tears of repentance. Nor did he strike down with death the persecuting soul, as the ends of the earth be deprived of salvation. The Lord 
doesn't condemn us to the point that we cannot turn back to him in this life. He always offers that way back. Parable of the prodigal son. He always offers that way back. Because it is not in God's interest nor desire to do so. God desires that all men might be saved, all people might be saved. That is his desire. But he has given us free will. And so he knows that it will not always be our desire or our choice. And so he always offers us that possibility in this life to turn back to him. And in doing so, he displays patience. And so must we be with ourselves patient when we do not instantly start living as the greatest saint on earth. When we start to take our faith seriously because we fall sometimes in small ways sometimes in great ways but the road road to repentance is always there through the sacrament of reconciliation and so pope benedict the 16th pope emeritus when he was talking about this he warns catholics he warns us of this temptation today the temptation of impatience that we want immediate success. Any endeavour that we do in the church, we want instant success. Any endeavour that we do that we think is what God wants, we want instant success. With our own lives of faith, we want instant success. I'm going to go to confession and then I will never sin again. We want instant success. But it's not always like that. It's not always like that. For the kingdom of God, as well as the evangelization, the instrument and vehicle of the kingdom of God, the parable of the grain of mustard seed is always valid, always slow growth. Immediate massive growth is not the way that God does things. Christianity didn't just bloom instantly overnight across the entire world. It was through succeeding centuries of great missionaries that it has spread as far as it has spread, that we've even heard of it. Christianity didn't reach Britain instantly, over time. And so we should always go on evangelising the secular world. But it will not immediately, Pope Benedict again, it, it will not immediately attracting the large masses, numbers, that have distanced themselves from the church by using new and refined methods. Just because we start doing things really, really well, people are not going to come back in their droves. And I think to an extent we've seen this as lockdown finishes. We're now celebrating mass publicly again. We all hoped that there'd be massive queues for the church. And there hasn't been. To an extent, that's people concerned about their safety. But also people that we hope to reach out to haven't necessarily returned. We're not going to get instant results. Rather, it will mean to dare once again and with the humility of the small grain to leave up to God the when and the how it will grow. Only the Lord knows how the faith will grow and expand. We can produce wonderful resources it can be all singing, all dancing. But only when the Lord opens the hearts of these people will it truly begin to grow. Only he knows the time, the place, the moment to do that. And what we need is patience to persevere in the mission field. We all know people who have lapsed from the faith. And when we suddenly become really serious about our faith, maybe, we expect them to suddenly follow in. And it doesn't work like that. I know people, and even from my own example, of who have siblings who are priests, brothers who are priests, but they don't believe. And you think, how is that possible? It is. It's true. 
and it exists. We must be patient with them. Patient with our children, maybe, who have turned from the faith. Always leave that door open for them to return. Always witness to the importance of our faith to them. We need patience when it comes to projects in the parish, which we think are going to take off instantly, and then they don't. We need patience when it comes to evangelising at work or among our friends. Because the Lord shows that patience with us. It will grow. We should not uproot and chuck out those who are sinful from our community. But be patient. Pray for them. Support them. Strengthen them. Sometimes correct them. But be patient above all. The church has withstood greater difficulties than she withstands now. And she was patient through those times. Through the dark periods of persecution, which are still existing in parts of the world right now. Patience. Because that is the way of God. So that should be our way too. Above all, we need to trust in God.